listen to this the scripture consists of what has been heard not what was said think on that for a moment the scripture consists of what has been heard like the parable not what was really said from Yeshua or Ezekiel or Jeremiah you see they were saying something but it was packaged in their life hidden to mystery that's why the rabbis were pursuing this they understood these things there's this whole thing you see mm. this whole thing that we've not really understood in the West I'm gonna say that line again man it is so powerful if you get this scripture consists of what has been heard in other words they wrote down what they were supposed to write down but it wasn't what they were the person was saying what they were saying was literally hidden it's like the painter he knows what he's painting what his his passion his heart the revelation the 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 vision he's had <clears throat> he's putting it on canvas <clears throat> but you're not going to see that when you originally first look at it because it's hidden within there in the passion of the man and what he was portraying it's in music you know you can hear the musician he's playing the guitar or, or playing this instrument and he's got a whole thing of going on within him that you can't just pull up and say well that's the riff I mean there's more to that than what you think this is what this means the Lord said to me one time in 2005 when we were doing this thing learning how to um, worship by following the Holy Spirit and uh, <clears throat> we got to a state a certain spot and the Lord said have them tune their instruments and I said well what do you mean Lord tune their instruments and he said he said their instruments their hearts and they can't go any further until they tune their instruments you see what comes on the outside through the instrument of the guitar the vocal the drum the keyboard that is uh, only a reflection if there's anything on the inside the inside that's why David was so powerful that's why David when they said he was gonna play they would tell people to get off the buildings to get down because they were gonna fall because David heart his heart was he was a man after God his heart was in tune with the father and the the very essence of the father was coming through his heart into the instrument and then hitting the people this is where we're going got to tune the heart now in mark 8 hmm hey in mark 8 they've just fed the the 4000 with the bread and the fish and they got in these boats and they were heading over and then Jesus says I was warning them saying mind beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Herodes and they were reasoning with one another saying because we have no bread you see because they were relating it to the literal situation they were in they'd just been dealing with bread he's talking about leaven he must be talking about that and Yeshua being aware of it said to them why do you reason because you have no bread do you not perceive or understand is your heart still hard having eyes do you not see having ears do you do not hear and you do not remember remember is a big thing because you see we're not learning we're remembering remember we're going back to the beginning we're not heading to the end we're going to the beginning 
we're remembering who we really are is what's going on. It's all inside you. You're remembering. So, Yeshua is saying this to his disciples. And then, right after he tells them, and by the way, the leaven of the Pharisees would be the religious teaching of the day. The leaven of the Herodes, 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 I don't even know, Herodes, I will say, um, was Greek. It's the understanding in the mainstream, the Greek understanding. Uh, so, in the same verse, a, par- a powerful picture takes place that I want to take you in the four levels to see. It says, when they arrived, Mark 8, 22, when they arrived at Bethesda, <clears throat> and I'll break it, some of it as we go, the house of grace was Bethesda. Now, the house of grace is when you first become aware of Christ. It's called grace. Now, many of us don't stay in grace. We kind of like to take grace and then mix legalism in it, Judaism, which Jesus came to remove. But grace is Romans chapter 6. I'm crucified in Christ. It's the beginning of the journey. So now picture this. You've just started the journey at Bethesda, the house of grace. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus, begging him to touch him and heal him. So Jesus led him as his sighted guide outside the village. Now, this doesn't happen for many of us, but this should be what takes place. When it says that he took him uh, and he was now his sight, and he took him outside the village, what he was literally doing is taking him outside the mental construct of his belief system. Outside that group of people that we've been walking with that believe a certain way. This is how it started for me. Now, I got sidetracked at one point for 30 years, but this is the way it started for me. So I understand this. So he leads him outside the village because he's going to teach him. Then it says he places his saliva on the man's eyes and covers them with his hands. Now, this is just after you get saved, man. There's this experience that you have with the intimacy of God that is unbelievable. It says, kiss me uh, with the Song of Solomon, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth, for your kisses, they're better than wine. That's what that's like. That's what the saliva on your eyes is. He's beginning to open your eyes that there's something amazing here. Something beyond your understanding. And then he covers your eyes because he's covering the way you've seen things thus far. And now you're going to see through what he wants you to see. Okay, so then, then he asked him, now do you see anything? The guy says, yes. My sight is coming back. I'm beginning to see people, but they look like trees, walking trees. So then what happens is we enter into Romans chapter 7, and what I said earlier happens, it's like um, we still see everybody as individuals. We still see through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We're still in this perception of uh, good and evil, right and wrong, up and down, left and right, duality. We're still in duality, 
And so that's what the trees represent. And they're walking because they're individualities now, they're dualities. There's no, no unity in this. So Jesus puts his hands over the man's eyes a second time. Now that was the hint. Remember, there's the literal, then there's a hint. The hint is, you really think that the creator of the universe needs to pray for a man twice? No. Anybody that's told you that was to teach you to keep being persistent is just a carnal understanding of it. The hint is, that's not what this is about. He prays for him a second time because he wants him to move out of Romans 7 to Romans 8. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans 6, 7, and 8. He says to him, um, listen to what he says after he, it says he prays for him the second time. He says, he made him look up. You see, as long as you're looking in the world, in carnality, in the systems of the world, the matrix, you're still blind. You're still seeing men as trees. So even when we first become Christians and we're saved and hallelujah and we're walking and all that, <coughs> we're in Romans 7, we're still judging one another, we're walking in all this stuff, duality, what's right, what's wrong, brother, right? That's still blind. So he prays the second time, but he makes him look up now. Up out of the matrix. Come up here. You've heard this in church a thousand times, right? Come up here. What does he mean? Look up here. Spirit. Look to heaven, not earth. Earth is carnal. Heaven is spirit. Look to the spirit. Come up here. So he made him look up. The man opens his eyes wide, and he could see everything perfectly. His eyesight was completely restored, it says. That's Romans chapter 8. It says that we're in Christ. There's therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ. The law of the Spirit of life has released us from the law of sin and death. It's a whole new creation. We've entered a new creation. We'll call it a parallel universe that's going on right here. perfectly that's scripture in the scripture it says to be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect the the perfect day this is all language but it means one thing romans chapter 8 it means this that you've ascended jacob's ladder romans chapter 8 you can see now now you can see completely see in the spirit while walking here perfectly. The day of the Lord is another term for it. The fullness of the day is another term for it. His eyesight was completely restored, it says, and he could see all clearly. Romans 6 to Romans 8, to being in Christ. First Christ is in me like a seed. Everything that was in the seed is the whole thing of the tree is in the seed, but not until it matures. I go from a child of God to a son of God till it matures into the place that I am now in Christ. I understand what that means then. And I'm living it. I'm living it. Okay, so we go from carnality to spirit. Today, many prophets are having visions and dreams and interpreting them as seeing trees. And that's why we're having the end of the world every couple of decades <clears throat> and yet we're still here everybody wants to leave and the prayer lord's prayer says thy kingdom come oh I will be done where on earth in the third dimension oh father i'm sorry everybody was telling me to like, you know jump on the rapture boat to get out Delusion, illusion. What are we afraid of? We're God's sons. It's time to awaken. Time to awaken. 
even people that have had NDEs, near-death experiences, they think they see literal. So they come back and say, I've seen this. This is what it's like. I was in hell, brother. Really? Okay, well, tell me about it. You see, God is unveiling, but unless we look into it, we won't understand. Seeing they don't see, hearing they don't hear. They, it hasn't entered into the heart of man to understand. Got to tune the instrument, John. But if you stop short and merely memorize or quote Scripture, not penetrate and enter into the reality of what that word and the experience of that realm of life is, no changes come to you. There has to be a change. There has to be a change. Not about quoting the Bible. You can memorize the Bible and it won't benefit you at all. <laughs> you got to know what it is and enter into the kiss. You got to have the experience of a saliva on your eyes. You got to know. Got to know. Ganosko. You got to enter into the bedchamber. Song of Solomon. These are all just pictures, terms of an intimate, intimate place with God. <clears throat> this is where he's calling us today. Religion doesn't cut it. It's actually never cut it. It just pacifies us for a while. <clears throat> hmm. Jesus said it. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. Scriptures point to me. Remember I said that the, the lesser light, like the moon doesn't have any light, but the sun's shining on it. It's, it's pointing you to the sun, the greater light. So the lesser lights here in this realm like the pictures, like the scripture, point you to the greater light, which is the experience with him, the truth. All right, so laid a bit of a foundation for picture, symbology, and the depth of these things. Now I'm going to go in a little bit more of something else before we get where we're going. And this one here is really on the heart of God right now. And I'll probably do a video, a short one soon, uh, because he spoke to me a little about this last night, um, about this and how important this is and where we're going with this. First Peter, through the eternal and living word of God, you've been born again. Not by a book, by a living word. And this seed that he planted within you can never be destroyed, but will live and grow inside you forever. First Peter 1.23, you've been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Living word. John 6.48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the desert, yet they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that the one may eat it and not die. I'm the living bread, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. This bread <clears throat> is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Now, that's a picture he's telling us again, that what they taught was carnal word, and the people died. What he is, is not from spirituality or religion, but he's the creator, come into this world, descended into this realm, the word became flesh, to tell us the living word is what makes you alive. So the living word is not just a result of the written word. The living word is. And the written word is a light, a lesser light, that reveals the living word. It points. It's an arrow pointing to him. And there's mystery hidden in there how to find him. 
And then you enter into these things like the Song of Solomon, where Solomon was talking about this, places of intimacy. Like, wow. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made fashion formed into a woman. And he brought her and presented her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they will become one flesh. Okay. First of all, Adam is the name meaning humanity. It's the collective term equal to mankind. It wasn't a man. We all are asleep and something's been taken from us and we feel separated from God who is spirit and we don't feel whole. You see, and I'm going to show you this through now, Abraham, the same picture of what's going on in this realm. <laughs> you see, we are asleep. It says, doesn't it? Awake, O sleeper. Awake from the dead. It's, we were put to sleep because we were separated from that part of us, the feminine energy. Okay, so let's look now at Genesis 15. Several animals were cut in half and arranged along a path. Their purpose was to symbolize the penalty for breaking the covenant. You notice they were cut in half. What was happened? Eve was taken out of Adam. Two parts. What is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is a two-part being. It's not like we think. It's the beast nature, meaning we operate out of body and soul, no spirit. Because our spirit, seemingly, was removed. And so, it's just a beast nature. And continuing even into Romans 7, when we first get saved, we're still blind. The guy was still blind. He's still seen trees. So, then it says, it, it, because it said it symbolizes, it's a symbol. It's a symbol again. He's told us right there. The two men entering into a covenant relationship walked between and around the animal parts in a figure eight. An eight on its side is the symbol for infinity. This was to show that they understood and accepted the penalty that the agreement committed, or sorry, and the agreement that it was committed them forever. That they were settling. It's a covenant. Marriage covenant. You see it? It's the marriage covenant. When God entered into his covenant with Abraham, promising him an heir and giving him the promised land. That's where we want to go, right? Eden, the promised land. They're all pictures again of this state of being. Heaven. Um, he was the only one who walked between the animals. This meant that only he was bound to the terms. Oh, <clears throat> this is good. There was nothing Abraham had to do. In fact, God put him to sleep. Oh. So what's happening when while we've been asleep, God came, manifested as Jesus, walked the covenant onto the cross. <laughs> do you see it? We're asleep. He's now telling us, he did it. There's nothing you can do. I'm cutting covenant with myself for you. I'm coming as you for you. Right? God didn't beat his son up on the cross for you. <laughs> he came. He came. The Father came 
for you. And he cut covenant while we've been asleep and not aware of who we really are. This is so powerful. He promised him, he says, God put Abraham to sleep so he couldn't participate. This isn't a bad thing that's going on. The land was given to Abraham and his descendants and children. What is his descendants? They're not Jewish. They're not Christians. They're children of faith. They're all that will turn to him. We were all the sons of God, the whole human race. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Remember, neither rich nor poor, neither slave nor bond or, or um, master, but we're one in Christ. So the Lamb was given to them unconditionally in perpetuity, which means a security that pays for an infinite amount of time infinitely this is what the father did in christ while we've been asleep here adam was asleep abraham's asleep we're asleep it's telling us about us then paul shows up and he goes in colossians for god is satisfied to have all of his fullness dwelling in christ who is Christ? It's us. It's the corporate body, the many-membered body. Jesus was the head of the body. Jesus Christ is not his last name. They didn't have last names. They were the son of. Jesus the Christ. You see? He is the mystic secret of God. He's what God was doing. He was creating an ark. <coughs> Bring us all back in the ark. Hmm. So it says, the fullness dwelling in Christ, and by his, the blood of his cross, everything where? In heaven, that's spirit, and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. This is what he did in Jesus. While we were asleep here, we created religion, by the way, but this is what he did. And he restored us. Remember this, uh, Psalm 23. It says um, that he led me by the still water. And I looked into it. And what's still water? It's a mirror. Paul said, behold, I see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face, I will know as I've been known who I really am. And that's what it's talking. Restored. He restoreth my soul. Puts it back in original condition. The beginning. To who we really are. Back to the beginning. Paul says there's a divine mystery. I have a secret surprise, he says, that's been concealed from the world for generations. But now it's being revealed, unfolded, manifested for every holy believer to experience. Experience the kiss. Living within you, each one of us, living within you, he goes, is the Christ who floods you with what? The expectation of glory. What's glory? I told you a few weeks ago, glory is called discover my light. Discover my light. That's the revelation of who he really is, the light, the word, Yeshua, the living word. Discover it. So there's an expectation inside of us. So what is it that's causing this expectation? Paul's telling you it's Christ in you that's causing this expectation. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest. There's a treasure chest inside of us with hope filled with the riches 
of the discover my light glory for his people and god wants everyone to know it god wants everyone to know it in the fullness of time he did this right hmm it's everyone to know it let me see where i am there we are christ is our message we preach to what paul awaken hearts and bring every person into the full understanding of truth it has become my inspiration and passion paul says to minister to labor with tireless intensity with his power flowing through me to present every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in jesus christ you see it in everyone the whole human race no clubs <laughs> just one new man jesus christ ephesians 5 husbands love your wives as their own bodies we're back to adam and eve this has nothing to do with marriage and i've used it for years at wedding ceremonies but this is the mystery hmm <laughs> You should love your wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one hates his own flesh, but rather nourishes and cherishes it, even as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. Are you ready? This is a great mystery. I speak to you in reference to Christ and his church. <clears throat> okay. I want to read a quote from the Gospel of Truth. Within us, we contain both the uncreated and the created adam and eve the divine and the human where does the one begin and the other end the question is not why but how how can we live so that we're one as in this is what jesus told us I am the Father are one. How can we realize this union of God and human as manifested in Yeshua, the Christ, with neither separation nor confusion? How can we live fully the consequences of the thenopric, which means in a human form, both divine and human? This says, the theopric wedding of created and uncreated. You see, you have an uncreated part that was removed from you, from your understanding. It's in, it's in you. It's never not been. But you don't know it. So that's why we're like we're asleep. And Yeshua comes while we're asleep and walks the figure eight, meaning commits the covenant on the Calvary, reveals the flesh and blood that we need to partake in order to awaken to come back to this reality. Is there separation? Separation is the word for sin. Their sin doesn't exist, it's separation. And sin is the result of separation is the issue the jews jews called it missing the mark separation and so mm, let me keep going on In the gospel thomas logging 22 it says this is what jesus said when you make the two into one when you make the inner like the outer, 
the high like the low when you make male and female into a single one. You see? He's telling us what Paul talked about in the marriage. He's talking about what was going on in Genesis all through the Bible. This is what he's saying. When you make the two one. This is why we need the living word, because the living word is going to bring us up the ladder, up that mountain, face to face with the Father, back into union with himself. With himself. I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and we're one. We've been taught so much about sin consciousness that we could never believe that, and then we were placed God at a long distance away in a place called heaven, so we could never enter into it. Terrible stuff. It's not the truth. It's anti-gospel. The gospel teaches us something totally different. But you see, we were just listening and doing. Jacob Boheme, a a German mystic and theologian, He lived from 1575 until 1624. He says this, The Holy Ghost shall be in the hearts of the faithful in Zion. I acknowledge and I know it. For Zion shall not be from without, but it's in the new man. It's already born. He that would seek it, let him but seek himself. Depart from the old Adam into a new life, and he shall find whether Jesus is born in him. You see, it's inside you. This whole thing's about you. It's within you. If he finds it not, let him enter into himself and seriously consider himself, and he shall find Babel and her workings in him. There he must destroy and enter into God's covenant. And then Zion will be revealed to him and in him. And he will be born with Christ in Bethlehem of Judea in the dark stable. Not in Jerusalem, as reason feigns, but Christ should be born in the old ass. The old ass must become servant and serve the new man in Zion. The carnal man has to let go. The egoic man must let go and serve the master, which is you in Christ. Coming to that marriage, that fullness, that union, that oneness. Now, and with this, the Song of Solomon Chapter 8, verse 5. A beautiful picture. Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her lover? Under the apple tree, I roused you. There your mother travailed with you. There, she who was in labor gave you birth. Now, wilderness is an Aramaic symbol of entering into a place of being unprotected. Welcome to the world, where you deal with the illusions and fears in your mind that we call demons, until you enter through the gate of sacred light in a higher state or dimension within your own heart, even as Jesus did. There's a place in Israel where Jesus ascended to a cave. And this is where he was when it says that he went out in the wilderness, was tempted for 40 days. It wasn't the desert, and it wasn't the wilderness. The wilderness is where you lay down all your protections. You want to see what's within your own mind. And he went there to deal with the carnal mind, to deal with what we fight with, the egoic mind. And so he dealt with these things. And he ascended into the Father. He transfigured right there. 
That's where this went down for him. And that's what's going on with us, is we're going through a process. In the carnal state, is called earth. And our mother is earth. Maya, they call her. Now, what is, what is it, our mother, the earth? Because this physical being, I receive food from the earth, I receive light from, from the sun, I receive water from the earth, and uh, through the rain, I receive everything that sustains and gives me life. She's my mom. You see it? And she's travailing to bring me to birth. That's why we're here. We're to be born. So we're going through this spot as she's travailing to give us birth into that thenopric. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Thenopric, human form of divine and human. A wedding of created and uncreated. That's what's going on. Is we're in our mom. She's taking care of us until we deal with these things. I heard a man not that long ago talk about the fact that one of the first things that happens, I won't go into the whole thing because of the time, but the first thing that happens with a baby is it learns love and trust. Mommy loves me, and I can trust her. She'll take care of me. If you don't have love and trust in God, that's what you need foundationally. You see, and there's levels going from there. You go through an orphan state, you go through different states until you get to that place. And I seen the father once in the way he wanted me to understand him because he showed me a, a guy and I seen pure innocence. In fact, I thought when I seen him, because it was just, it's an aspect right of him. I seen uh, what you see is what you get. There was no shadows of turning, nothing. No second thoughts around him, nothing. And yet I knew that I felt like I had to protect him. If the world only knew who you were, man, they would abuse you and use you. Well, that's never happening. <laughs> Seriously? But I was seeing how pure and innocent and loving he is. Unconditional love. Unconditional love. Yeah, we hit the, uh, the lottery jackpot. Jackpot. Maybe it was a put, too. Anyway, getting just a little drunk here. God is amazing. And so I'm going to take two minutes. Instead of doing that other video, I might do it anyway, but I'm going to drop it here as well. God woke me up last night, and he began to speak to me about the living word. We put this together, and then he began to say to me, John, this is the, a defining moment, so I'm telling you now. If you want to call it prophesying, you can call it prophesying, call it anything you like. But what I'm telling you is there's a change happening because God now is going to begin uh, elevating the presence of his living word so that you will see what is living what isn't living. Because up until now, we have not known John, Jesus. They know you're alive. No, they don't. <laughs> Go and tell them I'm alive. They think I'm a history book. They think I'm, you know, if I quote these scriptures, everything's dandy. No, it's me. It's me you need to know, the living word. So he is going to up this. And I don't think it's going to end. I think that there's a new thing coming. And I believe it's like Isaiah 60, arise and shine for your light has come. What does it say? And the glory of the Lord has risen, risen upon you. What's the glory? Discover my light. The revelation of God has landed on you, and they will come to the glory of your rising. That's how important this is. This is that important, that we understand 
Um, we're moving out of the days of religion, and we're moving into the days of the manifestation of Jesus, of the Christ in us, in us, coming forth. The light comes in us, right? Through us. But first, it must come to us. We must know the living word. And so, Manny, I mean, I must have been in it for like an hour or so last night. He was just bathing me in it and telling me, tell them, tell them. This is what's going to start happening. And so that's why I said tonight, if you feel something quickening to you, if you feel some energy, if you feel something from this, this isn't me. I'm no magician. It's the living word. Talk to him. Let him quicken and awaken you. That's what this is all about. We're all on the journey. We are all one new man, the Christ, the new Jerusalem, coming down from the mountain. After we ascend, we come down the mountain to change the human race. It's good news. It's great news because God's good. He's always been good, and he's in a great mood. He's not caught up in our illusions. That's why we're in the wilderness, a lot of us, because we're still in the delusions, in the matrix. We're all fighting over things, you know? That's why it's, you know, taking sides on stuff, and both sides are wrong, because they're both in illusions. It's love. For God so loved the world. God loved the world. So let's get married. Eh? Let's get married. Let's each of us enter in to the bedchamber like Esther after three days. She entered in. Picture. It's a picture. Picture.